Hi everybody, welcome to Vaishayas. This is Pranay Mulaguri and we are going to continue the Tamil Nadu History Textbook Part 1 of Class 11th. Before I start the class, I request everybody to like and share this video. Subscribe to the channel if you are new and please WhatsApp us on the number provided for any sort of information regarding the test series or any other paid courses. Let us start. Chapter number 10, Advent of Arabs and Turks. So what we are going to learn? To learn the nature and the outcome of Arab conquest of Sindh and military rights of Mahmud of Ghazni and Muhammad of Ghor. To acquire knowledge about the nature of Delhi Sultanate under its various dynasties. To know the socio-economic conditions of the country under the Sultanate. To understand the impact of Islam in India with reference to syncretism in literature, art, music and architecture. So this class will be the part one of the chapter. So we will be covering uh, the half of the chapter in the next video. Introduction. The period from 13th to 16th centuries, 1200 to 1550s, saw the arrival of Islamic institutions and Islamic culture in India. So, uh, as we have read in the previous chapters, that you know, uh, most of uh, the southern part of India, the in the last chapter, we have seen like you know, the as soon as the emperor dies, most of the uh, other uh, part of the empire gets uh, divided and they call themselves independent. Because of that uh, smaller kingdoms, they were very weak. And uh, since they were weak, they were very prone to the people coming from other uh, places. Okay, the same way the Islamic institutions and Islamic culture have arrived. Okay, historians have interpreted the history of this period from different differing perspectives. Conventionally, the regimes of Sultanate have been evaluated in terms of achievements and failures of individual sultans. It has been you know, evaluated through achievements and failures of individual sultans. Okay, a few historians critiquing this personality oriented history have evaluated the Sultanate as having contributed to material and cultural development, leading to evolution of composite culture in India. Okay, so they have arrived between uh, 13th to 16th century. Okay, and uh, the history of the Sultanate and Sultans have been evaluated through the achievements and failures of individual Sultan. It has not been considered as a whole because uh, there were you know different dynasties, there were different perspectives of each and every Sultan. Uh, each and everybody has their own uh, way of uh, uh, ruling. Okay, There were uh, many clashes between them. Uh, they had a lot of fights between themselves itself and you know uh, even brothers, uh, uh, they killed, uh, you know, even being brothers, uh, they killed uh, their own brothers and all that, okay. Historians focusing on history of class relations, okay, have argued that the medieval state served as the agent of ruling class and hence these regimes of Sultanate were diminutive in their institutional advancement when compared with the great Mughals. Thus, there is no consensus yet amongst scholars in determining, uh, determining the true nature of the Sultanate. Twofold objective to introduce the students to a conventional study of rulers, events, ideas, people, and their conditions under the Sultanate, to structure the content in such a way that the students examine it critically and raise new questions. See, as we have studied in the previous slides, that the history, the specific, this part of the history, which has been mentioned, uh, uh, you know, with the start of Islam, uh, there were a lot of perspectives, okay, uh, the people writing uh, through the eyes of uh, Islamic people, the, the migrant people coming from uh, Turkey, maybe the Central Asian countries, uh, the, the opinion of theirs was a lot different from the opinion of others. So, 
we are just going to do a conventional study of the rulers events ideas and people rather than not going very critically uh, and analytically into the stuff so we shall start advent of arabs the context how they arrived the geographical location of arabia facilitated trade contact between india and arabia as seafaring traders the pre islamic arabs had maritime contacts with western and eastern coasts of india okay they already had maritime uh, contacts with the western and eastern coasts of india okay while there were south indian settlements in persian gulf arabs too settled in malabar and coromandel Arabs who married Malabar women settled down on the west coast were called Mappilais. Okay, so uh, uh, you know uh, these Arabic people and Indian people already had contacts because of the maritime trading. Okay, the sea trade. Okay, couple of South Indian people settled in the Persian Gulf, as well as lot of Arabian people who married the Malabar women and settled in the western coast were called as Mappilais. The Mappilais means the son-in-laws. Okay, Arab military expedition in 712 and subsequent Ghaznavid and the military raids intended to loot and use the resources ceased to strengthen their power in Central Asia. Created a relationship of the conqueror and the conquered. Following invasion of Afghanistan by Khurasan, the Eastern Iran Shah and later Genghis Khan. severed the ties of north indian sultanate with afghanistan mongol invasions destroyed the gurid sultanate and ghazni and cut into the resources of sultan nasiruddin kubacha in uh, kubacha who was around 1206 to 1228 the ruler of kutch and multan okay so the arab military expedition in 712 okay see uh, most of the uh, expeditions coming from the arab side were intended to loot okay most most the major reason was to loot okay thus the sultan iltutmish had opportunity of expanding his influence in northern india that enabled muslim rulers to rule indian provinces with delhi as capital for about 4 centuries okay so how and all we will see though it is a customary to describe this period as muslim period the rulers of medieval india came from different regions and ethnicities okay so there were different kind of people coming okay few were arabs few were turks few were persians few were central asians okay they were involved in militarily and administratively iltutish Uh, Iltutmish was an old Persian Turk. Okay, he was an old Persian Turk, and many of his military slaves were of different Turkish and Mongol ancestries, brought to Delhi by merchants from Bukhara, Samarkand, and Baghdad. There were slaves of other ethnicities as well, notably Hindu Khans, captured from Mihir in Central India, but he gave them all Turkish titles. Okay, the Sultanate. the sultanate was from 1206 to 1526 it was also not homogeneous there were five dynasties involved with a lot of blood uh, and you know a lot of killing okay the first was the slave dynasty 1206 to 1290 khalji dynasty 1290 to 1320 the tughlaq dynasty 1320 to 1414 said dynasty from 1414 to 1451 and the lodi dynasty from 1451 to 1526 remember which is the longest working okay you need to have that information prelims question may arrive like this like which one uh, which of the following dynasties of the slave dynasty uh, sorry of the sultanate delhi sultanate was the longest serving dynasty okay so you need to remember so uh, you need to remember these facts Okay. And also, Persian chronicles speak about the Delhi Sultanate in hyperbolic terms. Their views dealing with the happening during the period of Sultan Sultan were critically appropriated into modern scholarship. It was said by Sunil Kumar in *Emergence of Delhi Sultanate*. So, what are the sources for the study of Delhi Sultanate? Al-Baruni's *Tarikh Al-Hind*. 
which is an Indian philosophy and religion written in Arabic. Min, Minaj us Siraj wrote Tabakat e Nasiri in 1260, which is actually a world Islamic history in Arabic. Ziyadun, Ziyauddin Barani wrote Tariq e Firoz Shahi in 1357, history of Delhi Sultanate up to Firoz Tughlaq. Amir Khusraus, Mista ul Futuh, Victories of Jalaluddin Khalji, Khazain ul Futuh, Victories of Allahuddin Khalji, written in Persian. Tughlaq Nama, The History of Tughlaq Dynasties in Persian. Shamsi Siraj Afif, wrote Tariq e Firuz Shahi, after Bernice accounts of uh, Delhi Sultanate in Persian. And uh, Gulam, Yahya bin Ahmad's Tariq e Mubarak Shahi, written in Persian during the reign of Sayyid ruler Mubarak Shah. Ferishta, History of the Muslim Ruler in India, written in Persian. This is very important for the prelims. The Arab conquest of Sin. The governor of Iraq, the Arab governor of Iraq, Hajjaj bin Yusuf, under the pretext of acting against the pirates, sent two military expeditions against Dahar, the ruler of Sin. Okay? He sent two military expeditions to save the so, uh, from the so-called pirates, okay? which were not there actually, against the Dahar, the ruler of Sin, one by land and other by the sea. Both were defeated and killed. Both the expeditions failed. Okay? Hajjaj then sent with the caliph's permission a full-fledged army with 6,000 strong cavalry and large camel corps carrying all requirements under the command of his son-in-law, a 17-year-old Muhammad bin Qasim. Okay? The expeditions failed. So what he did is he sent a full-fledged army of 6,000 strong cavalry, a camel corps with the lead as his son-in-law, a 17-year-old guy, his name was Muhammad bin Qasim. So this guy was Muhammad bin Qasim. Muhammad Qasim marched on the fortress of Brahmanabad, where Dahar was stationed. Okay, it was against Dahar, as we have discussed in the previous slide, and he was in Brahmanabad with a huge army. Dahar's wazir, the prime minister, betrayed him. Okay, Dahar's wazir betrayed him. So. Here you can see, uh, from now onwards, you will see a lot of betrayals, a lot of uh, uh, bloodshed inside the family itself. Like, you know, they kill their brothers be, uh, for the power and the throne. Okay, this kind of stuff will be very common. And you will see a lot of stuff in the coming chapters, which was followed by desertion of a section of his forces. Okay, so Dahar, the prime minister of uh, uh, Sorry, Dars Wazir, the Prime Minister of Dahar, uh, betrayed and also he, uh, you know, uh, uh, removed a lot of section of the forces. Okay, the predecessors of Dahar, the Brahmin rulers of Sin, had unsurped the power from earlier Buddhist ruling dynasty of Sin, and with the patronage of Dahar, Brahmins had occupied all higher positions. The predecessors of Dahar, the uh, the successors are basically after the the predecessors are basically before the okay they were the brahmin rulers of sin and because you know uh, they were uh, in the ruling dynasty they had huge patronage from dahar brahmins okay this led to discontentment and therefore dahar lacked popular support in this context it was easy for muhammad qasim to capture brahmanabad Qasim thereupon ravaged and plundered Debal for three days. Qasim called on the people of Sindh to surrender, promising full protection to their faith. He sent the customary one-fifth of the plunder to Caliph and divided the rest among his soldiers. See here, Qasim directly he plundered for around three days, it has been given. But uh, <coughs> he called on the people of Sindh to surrender. Okay, he was not killing them, but rather he was saying to surrender. Okay, so the main intention uh, here it uh, clearly is basically 
he wanted the booty. Okay. The Arab conquest of Sin has been described as triumph without results because it touched but a fringe of the country which after Qasim's expedition had a respite from invasions for about <coughs> three centuries. Okay. So next comes the Mahmud of Ghazni. In the meantime, the Arab Empire in Central Asia had collapsed with several of its provinces declaring themselves as independent as usual. Okay. One of the major kingdoms that emerged out of the broken Arab Empire was the Samanid Kingdom. Okay. Samanid Kingdom which also splintered leading, uh, leading to several independent states. Okay. In 963, Alap a Turkish slave who had served uh, severe Samanids as their governor in Khurasan seized the city of Ghazni in eastern Afghanistan. Okay. He was he had served as the governor okay, of the Samanids in Khurasan. Okay and uh, seized the city of Ghazni in eastern Afghanistan and established an independent kingdom. Alaptigin died as soon after. Okay? After the failure of three of his successors, the nobles enthroned Subaktigin. Okay? After Alaptigin, there were three successors who failed. After that came into the picture this Subaktigin. Subaktigin initiated the process of southward expansion into Indian subcontinent. Okay? He was the guy who started expanding into the southern part of, uh, sorry, uh, to the Indian subcontinent. So, there is a small information to Arabs and Iranians. India was Hind. Basically, India was Hind for Arabs and Iranians in their language. And the Indians were Hindus. Okay. All the Indians were Hindus, basically. But as Muslim communities arose in India, the main Hindu came to apply to all Indians who were not Muslims. Okay. He defeated the Shahi ruler of Afghanistan, Jayapal. Okay, the uh, Afghanistan had the ruler Jayapal. He was defeated and conferred the governorship of the province on Mahmud, his eldest son. When Sabuktagin died in 997, Mahmud was in Khurasan. Okay, Mahmud was in Khurasan. So his brother Ismail, the younger son of Sabuktagin, had been named his successor. Okay. See here, he was eldest, so it was more or less, he uh, was the suitable guy who was to be the successor okay, of Sabuktagin. But because of his absence, Ismail was declared as the successor. But Ismail was defeated in a battle. Mahmud, who was 27, ascended the throne and Caliph also acknowledged his accession. Okay, He sent him a robe of investiture and by configuring uh, conferring on him the title Yamani Uddawla, the right hand of the empire. Okay. The <coughs> Ismail was defeated. Okay. And Caliph also acknowledged as uh, uh, him as the successor and he gave him the title of Yamani Uddawla, the right hand of the empire. So, Mahmud's military rights. Mahmud ruled for 32 years. During his period, he conducted as many as 17 military campaigns into India. Okay, he conducted as many as 17 military campaigns into India. He targeted Hindu temples that were depositories of vast treasures. Okay, as we know uh, previously in the previous chapters too, we have seen uh, the Hindu temples were uh, donated heavily by the kings as well as you know a lot of. Uh, people, uh, uh, merchants and all that, they were you know, donated heavily, the Brahmins were uh, donated heavily. So uh, these temples used to be depositories of vast treasures. Okay? So they attacked the Hindu temples. Though the motive was to loot, obviously as we have discussed the main motive was to loot, Okay, but there was also a military advantage in demolishing temples and smashing hurdles. What was it we will say? The Ghaznavid soldiers viewed it as also a demonstration of the invincible power of their god. Okay, what they say is, our god is great. The religious passions of Mahmud's army expressed itself in slaughter of infidels and plunder and destruction of their places of worship. Okay. 
whoever is not following the uh, Islam or you know the God of Islam they were infidels and they used to plunder and distract their places of worship however there is little evidence of any large scale conversion of people to their faith okay there was you know no information regarding conversion the conversion was not happening as per the books even those uh, who became muslims to save their lives and properties returned to their orig original faith when the threat of ghaznavid invasion ceased okay <coughs> after defeating the shahi king anandapala mahmud went beyond punjab okay penetrating deep into indo gigantic plain before reaching kanauj mahmud raided mathura also okay in later historiography of both the british and indian nationalists mahmud is notorious for his invasion of the temple city of somnath in 1025 on the sea shore in gujarat okay in somnath uh, the temple was plundered it was destroyed you know the idols were destroyed many scholars argue that these plundering raids were more political and economic character than of religious chauvinism desecration of temples vandalizing the images of deities were all the part of asserting once authority in medieval india this was the way to show the power that we are much more powerful mahmud's raids and his deeds fit this pattern though their memories were due to creation of communal divide so basically his raids were mainly of economic reason okay but since you know the 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 passing of information happens in that way and you know because of their acts also uh, 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 adding to the uh, raids okay they were uh, plundering they were killing uh, people they were uh, uh, you know breaking the religious cultures maybe uh, temples and all which created a communal divide the plundering raids of mahmud were to meant uh, meant to replenish the treasury to maintain his huge army since he had huge army he need to feed them right he need to pay them the salaries and all huh? so that is the reason he had those raids okay the turks relied on a permanent professional army it was built around an elite corp of mounted archers who were all slaves bought trained equipped and paid in cash from the war booty taken alike from hindu kingdoms in india and muslim kingdoms in iran okay it was just not from the hindu kingdom of india but also muslim kingdoms of iran this is a example or uh, this is uh, you know evident enough to show that it was the reason the raids were happening because of the economic meaning rather than the religious meaning because they did not leave the muslim regions also specifically in iran okay persian sources contain exaggerated claims about the wealth plundered from these raids for instance it is claimed that mahmud's plunder of iranian city of rain 1029 bought in 500000 dinars okay worth of jewels and 260000 dinars in coins and over 30000 dinars worth of gold and silver vessels similarly mahmud's raid on somnath is believed to have brought in 20 million dinars worth of spoils you need to understand this amount okay this 20 billion dinars how much they were plundering because of that reason itself okay they constantly were doing these raids they were constantly looting the people Romila Thapar points uh, points out that those who had suffered from the predatory invasions seem to maintain a curious silence about them, as Hindu and Jain sources uh, available on Somnath expedition do not corroborate the details of or viewpoints found in Arab chronicles. That's what I said. Okay, in this uh, Hindu and Jain sources, the Somnath expedition has not been equated. Okay. the information was not correctly matching with the information provided by the arab uh, 
uh, writers basically and this was the Somnath temple okay which was destructed plundered by the people such plundering raids were economic and iconoclastic economic is basically uh, you know they were getting money they were getting all the stuff and it was iconoclastic they were creating a kind of uh, benchmark kind of a thing or they were just trying to prove something okay and communal character was attributed to them at a later stage okay since <coughs> slowly the soldiers were also in a way that our god is great huh? your god is nothing so we are able to break uh, your god's idol or temples so that created a kind of hatred and that created a communal character in the future stage they represented the kinds of disasters that were inseparable from the contemporary warfare and the usual plundering nature of rulers of medieval period. The history of Ghaznavid dynasty after the death of Mahmud is a story of endless clashes over succession between brothers, cousins and uncles. Okay, as soon as the Mahmud died, there were endless clashes for the succession. There were, however, exceptions like Sultan Ibrahim who ruled for over 42 years and his son Masood who ruled for 17 years. They were exceptions, they did not fight. The ever hanging threat from Ghuris from the north and Seljuk Turks from the west proved to be disastrous for the kingdom. Okay, They were constantly trying to threaten. Okay, The later rulers of Ghaznavid dynasty could exercise their authority only in Lahore region and even this lasted only for three decades. Okay. In 1186, Guri prince Muizuddin Muhammad invaded Punjab and seized Lahore. The last ruler Khurao Shah was imprisoned and murdered in 1192. Okay. With his death, the Ghaznavid house of Mahmud came to end. The last ruler was Khurao Shah and was murdered in 19, uh, sorry, 1192. Okay. Then comes Muhammad Ghori. In Ghaznavid invasions were intended to loot the Ghurids enlarged their scope to establish garrison towns to ensure the regular flow of plunder and tribute. See, Ghaznavid came, went with plunder. Okay. They came uh, with the army, they went with the loot. But uh, <coughs> the Gurits, the Gori people, what they did is they started settling up couple of garrisons such that it will be done in a very regular way. Okay, the flow will be regular. Muizuddin Muhammad of the Gori dynasty, known generally as Muhammad Gori, invested in territories he seized. Through the 1180s and 90s, the 1190s, Ghori established garrisons in the modern provinces of Punjab, Sindh, and Haryana. These centers of military power soon attracted the in-migration of mercenaries in search of opportunities. These mercenaries were recruited to organize fiscal and military affairs of the Sultanate. The Sultan's military commanders in North India were drawn from his elite military class. Okay, so they started establishing garrisons because of that. They, uh, you know, the merchants, the merchant class started opportunities, and uh, these mercenaries were recruited to organize, organize the, uh, you know, the monetary and military affairs. And uh, military commanders in North India were drawn from his military elite class. Specially trained in warfare and governance, these slaves were different from agrestics related to land or field labor and domestic slaves. Okay, these were specially trained in warfare and governance. These are not like you know somebody you just put, pull out a labor guy and hand over him a gun or something. Okay, these were specially trained because of that reason itself their army was very powerful. Lahore, then Uch and Multan were initially considered significant centers of power. In 1175, Gori headed for the city of Multan, which he seized from its Ismaili ruler. The fort of Uch fell without a fight. 
the chalukyas of gujarat inflicted a crushing defeat on mohammad ghori at mount abu after this defeat ghori changed the course of his expedition consolidating his position in sindh and punjab okay he was defeated by the chalukya uh, chalukyas of gujarat and because of that they changed their path okay next comes the prithvi raj chauhan ghori attacked the fortress of tabar hinda which is in bhatinda now which is in punjab strategic point for the chauhans of ajmer the rulers of ajmer prithvi raj chauhan marched to tabar hinda and faced the invaders in the first battle of tarain in 1191 Prithviraj scored a brilliant victory in this battle but failed to consolidate his position believing this battle to be a frontier fight and did not expect the gurits to make regular attacks Ghori was wounded and carried away by horsemen to safety Contrary to the expectations of Prithviraj Chauhan Mohammad Ghori marched into India in the following year okay see here he was wounded and carried away by a horseman to safety so uh, prithviraj chauhan thought like he might not come because he was already hurt and he knows how powerful they are but still in the next year he came prithviraj chauhan underestimated the potential danger of the enemy <coughs> in the second battle of tarain one of the turning points in indian history prithviraj suffered a crushing defeat and was eventually captured okay he was captured okay ghori restored him to his throne in ajmer but on charges of treason he was later executed okay and ghori's trusted general qutubuddin aibak was appointed as his deputy in india a small information al biruni mathematician philosopher astronomer and historian came to india along with mahmud of ghazni he learned sanskrit studied religious and philosophical texts before coming uh, before composing his work kitabul hind which is written about the india he also translated the greek work of euclid into sanskrit he also transmitted the aryabhata's magnum opus aryabhatiyam the thesis the earth's rotation around its axis creates day and night to the west he was the inter civilization connect between in the end the rest of the world so a small book written by el baruni okay gave us a lot of information for that point of time next comes the jayachandra of kanauj soon ghori was back in the to fight against the kanauj ruler jayachandra when all rajput chiefs had stood by prithvi raja in his battle against mohammad ghori Jayachandra stood apart as there was enmity between Prithviraj and Jayachandra on account of Prithviraj's abduction of Jayachandra's daughter Samyukta okay so Prithviraj abducted the Jayachandra's daughter Samyukta so he did not like uh, the Prithviraj so they had enmity okay the Prithviraj and Jayachandra So Gauri easily defeated Jayachandra and returned to Ghazni with an enormous booty. On the way, while camping on the banks of Indus, he was killed by some unidentified assassins. Rajput kingdoms. By the beginning of 10th century, two powerful Rajput kingdoms, Gurjar Pratihara and Rajputas, had lost their power. Tomaras in Delhi, Chauhans in Rajasthan, Solankis in Gujarat, Parmaras in Malwa, Gahadawalas in Kanauj, and Chandelas in Bundelkhand had become important ruling dynasties of northern India. Vigraha Raja and Prithviraj, two prominent Chauhan rulers, Bhoja of Parampara dynasty, Gharawala king Jayachandra, Yasa Varman. Kirti Varman of Chandelas were all strong in their own regions. Okay, so this is a small information. The world famous Khajuraho Temple complex, consisting of many temples, including the Lakshmana Temple, Vishwanatha Temple, and Kandariya Mahadeva Temple, was built by the Chandelas of Bundelkhand, who ruled from Khajuraho. Okay, 
The Rajputs had a long tradition of martial spirit, courage and bravery. There was little difference between the weapons used by Turks and the Rajputs. But in regimental discipline and training, the Rajputs were lax. Okay? See, there was no difference or very little difference between the weapons okay, but, uh, of the Turks and the Rajputs. But in regimental discipline and training, the Rajputs were behind. In planning their tactics to suit the conditions, the Turks excelled. Moreover, the Turkish cavalry was superior to the Indian cavalry. Okay? The Rajput forces depended more on war elephants, okay? which were spectacular but slow moving compared to Turkish cavalry. The Turkish horsemen, uh, horsemen had great mobility and were skilled in mounted archery. This was a definite military advantage which the Turks used well against their enemies and emerged triumphant in the battles. So, we shall start about the Delhi Sultanate, the foundations of Delhi Sultanate. First comes the slave dynasty. After the death of Gori, there were many contenders for power. One was Kutubuddin Aibak who ascended the throne in Delhi with his father-in-law, Yildiz remaining a threat to him for the next 10 years. The three important rulers of this dynasty are Kutubuddin Aibak, Iltutmish and Balban. The slave dynasty is also known as Mamluk dynasty which means property. Okay? It is also the term for Arabic desig uh, designation of a slave. Kutubuddin Aibak from 1206 to 1210. Kutubuddin Aibak was enslaved as a boy and sold to Sultan Muhammad Ghori at Ghazni. Impressed with his ability and loyalty, the Sultan elevated him to the ranks of Viceroy of the conquered provinces in the India. Muhammad bin Bhaktiyar Khalji, a Turkish general from Afghanistan, assisted him in conquering Bihar and Bengal. He was a slave, he was bought as a slave, but because of his loyalty and ability, he was raised to the rank of Viceroy and Muhammad bin Bhaktiyar Khalji, a Turkish general, assisted him in conquering Bihar and Bengal. Kutubuddin Aibak <coughs> reigned for four years. Okay? Lahore is an accident while playing in Chaugan. Okay? He died in Lahore in 1210 while playing Chaugan. Okay, he was playing a game similar to Polo, he died. Okay, Bhaktiyar Khalji is charged with destroying the glorious Buddhist university of Nalanda in Bihar. Okay, he Bhaktiyar Khalji, the general okay, of uh, the Kutubuddin Aivak, he was charged with the destroying the glorious Buddhist university of Nalanda in Bihar, who said, who is said to have mistaken it for a military camp. He thought it's a military camp. Detailed descriptions of Nalanda is found in the travel accounts of Chinese pilgrim Hyun Sang. The manuscripts and texts in the hundreds and thousands of uh, uh, th hundreds of thousands in the Nalanda library on subjects such as grammar, logic, literature, astronomy, and medicine were lost in the Turkish depredations. Next comes the Iltutmish. Shamsuddin Iltutmish from 1210 to 36 of Turkish extraction was a slave of Kutubuddin Aibak. Okay? This guy was a slave of Kutubuddin Aibak. Many of his elite slaves were also of Turkish and Mongol ancestry. They were brought to Delhi by merchants from trade centers like Bukhara, Samarkand and Baghdad. There were some slaves of other ethnicities as well, but Iltutmish gave them all Turkish titles. Iltutmish reliance on his military slaves, Bandagan, and his practice of appointing them for the posts of governors and generals in far off places did not change despite the migration into North India of experienced military commanders from distinguished lineages fleeing from Mongols. Shamsuddin Iltutmish, the slave and son in law of Kutubuddin Aibak, ascended the throne of Delhi setting aside the claim of Aram Shah 
the son of Qutbuddin Aibak. Okay, Aram Shah, who was the son of Qutbuddin Aibak, was interested to be the king. He wanted the throne of Delhi, but Qutbuddin Aibak, being the son-in-law, took charge. During his tenure, he put down the internal rebellions of Rajputs of Gwalior, Ratambur, Ajmer, and Jalor. He overcame the challenge of Nasiruddin Kapcha in Lahore and Multan and frustrated the conspiracy of Alivardhan, the governor of Bengal. You will read much more about this in the coming chapters. He diplomatically saved India by refusing to support the Khwarizmis Shah Jalaluddin of Central Asia against the Mongol ruler Chengiz Khan. Had he supported Jalaluddin, the Mongol should have overrun India with ease. Okay? This guy, Shah Jalaluddin, was fleeing from Central Asia. Okay? The Mongol ruler wanted this guy very badly and uh, as soon as he asked him about it, he was uh, given to the Mongols and we were safe. The, uh, India was safe from Mongols. If he was supporting Jalaluddin, the Mongols would have killed everybody clearly. Okay? His reign was remarkable for the completion of Qutub Minar. A colossal victory tower of 243 feet at Delhi. Okay, and for the introduction of copper and silver tanka, the two basic coins of Sultanate period. Iltutmish was responsible for the completion of Qutub Minar. Okay, please, uh, if you know who started to build the Qutub Minar and for whom, like on uh, whose name the Qutub Minar, the name Qutub came. Okay, why it was named Qutub Binar, kindly comment and the best comment will be pinned. Okay, and the silver tanka and the copper tanka were introduced by Ilthutmash itself. Bandagan is the plural of Banda, literally, literally meaning the military slaves. Okay, they were ranked according to the years of service, proximity and trustworthiness. This trust led to their appointment as governors and military commanders. The Gurid Bandagan in North India were the slaves of Muizuddin Guri. Since these slaves were without a social identity of their own, they were given new names by their masters, which included, in, uh, which included the Nisba, which indicated their social or religious identity. Okay? A simple question may, ask, may be asked, what is Nisba? Okay? Slave carry, slaves carried the nisbah of their master. Hence, Muiz, Muiz al-Din's slave carried the nisbah Muizi. And later, Sultan Shamsuddin Iltutmi's slaves were called the Shamshi Bandagan. Okay? So, nisbah was basically an indicator. Okay? So, uh, this guy's name was Muiz al-Adin. So, uh, the slaves carried nisbah Muizi. Okay? And Shamsuddin uh, Iltutmish uh, slaves were called as Shamshi Mandagan. Since the dynasty's traditions of slave regime were weak, succession to this throne was not smooth after Iltutmish's death. The monarch was succeeded by a son, a daughter, Sultana Razia, another son, and a grandson, all within 10 years, and finally by his youngest son. Sultan Nasir al Din Mahmud II from 1246 to 66. See, he was succeeded by a son, then a daughter also. A daughter was also made the uh, emperor who was uh, uh, Sultana Razia, then another son, then a grandson, and these all happened just within few couple of years, around 10 years. Okay. Iltutmish descendants fought long but in vain with the father's military slaves who had been appointed as governors of vast territories and generals of large armies. They constantly inferred in Delhi politics dictating terms to Iltutmish successors. Okay? So, more or less, the uh, people, the governor and the uh, generals and you know the major uh, big officers 
think more or less they were you know always interfering in delhi for to take and dictate the, the terms to the iltutmish successors though iltutmish royal slaves bandagani khas were replaced by junior bandagan the latter were not oriented to their master's vision of paramount monolithic sultanat to same extent as their predecessor okay so these people were not really uh, uh, good as their predecessors the slave governors located in the eastern provinces of lucknow the, the modern bengal and the punjab and the sindh provinces in the west were the first to break free from delhi see as soon as the weak ruler is ruling more and more dynasties more and more people will break uh, out of the empire those in the core areas from avadh khara on the river sarayu in the samana sunam in the punjab on the west sought to resist in the intervention of delhi by consolidating their home bases and allied with neighboring chieftains after two decades of conflict among the shamshi bandagan and the successive delhi sultans in 1254 ulug khan a junior and newly purchased slave in iltutmish reign and now the commander of shivalik territories northwest seized delhi this guy ulug khan was also a slave of iltutmish now this guy took over he took the title of naib e mulk the deputy of riyadh seizing the throne as sultan giyas aldin balwan or giyasuddin balwan in 1266 balwan the political intrigues of the nobility that destabilized the delhi sultanate came to an end with the accession of balwan as the sultan accession of authority by balban led to constant military campaigns against defiant governors and against their local allies barani mentions balban's campaigns in the region surrounding delhi and in the duab during these campaigns forests were cleared new roads and forts constructed the newly deforested lands given to freshly recruited afghans and others as rent free lands mafruzi and brought under cultivation new forts were constructed to protect trade routes and village markets see what kind of development he is doing the forests were clear new roads were made new forts were constructed the areas which got cleared were given to newly recruited afghanistan for rent free and they were brought under cultivation balban and the problem of law and order when balban took over the reins of power the law and order situation in ganga yamuna doab regions had deteriorated badly the rajput zamindars had set up forts and defeat the orders of the sultan okay they defeat the orders of the sultan mios a sultan a muslim community from northwestern region living in a heavily forested region around mewat were plundering the area with impunity balban took it as a challenge and personally undertook a campaign to destroy the mewatis mias were pursued and slaughtered mercilessly okay in the duab region the rajputs stronghold were destroyed jungle cleared colonies of afghan soldiers were established throughout the regions to safeguard the roads and deals the villages okay the rajput stronghold was also destroyed the jungles were cleared okay colonies of afghan soldiers were established and for uh, because the roads uh, you know to safeguard the roads basically okay and the villages to deal with the rebellions punitive expedition against tugril khan balban was ruthless in dealing with rebellions he appointed one of his favorite slave tugril khan as the governor of bengal 
but Tugril Khan soon became rebellious. Okay, he was the favorite slave. Okay, and he was appointed as governor of Bengal, but he became rebellious. Amin Khan, the governor of Oudh, sent by Balban to suppress the rebellion, meekly retreated. Engaged by this, Balban sent two more expeditions, which also suffered defeat. Tugril Khan, okay, defeated the first uh, expedition, and then two more uh, expeditions came. He defeated them also. Humiliated by these successive reverses, Balban himself proceeded to Bengal. On hearing Balban's approach, Tugril Khan fled. He fled from there. Okay. So Balban persuaded him first to Lucknowti, which is Bengal, and then towards Tripura, where he was captured and beheaded. He was beheaded. Okay, his head was, you know, cut down from the body. Gugra Khan, a son of Balban, was thereupon appointed the governor of Bengal, who carved out an independent kingdom after the death of Balban. See, he is the son of Balban. He was appointed as governor of Bengal. And as soon as Balban died, he carved out an independent kingdom and declared himself as the king. He did not claim the Delhi throne even in the midst of the leadership crisis. And his son, Kaikudbad, indulgence in the debauchery. Measures against Mongol threats. The Mongols were always into you know threatening these people. Okay. Balban used the threat of Mongols as a context to militarize his regime. Okay, the frontier regions were stretched with garrisons of forts at Bhatinda, Sunam, and Samana. Okay, at the same time, he took efforts to maintain a good relationship with Hulagu Khan, a Mongol viceroy of Iran and the grandson of Genghis Khan. Okay. Balban succeeded in obtaining from him the assurance that Mongols would not advance beyond Satluj. Halagu Khan reciprocated this gesture by sending a goodwill mission to Delhi in 1259. Okay, so he maintained a he maintained a soft relation with the Mongol viceroy of Iran, Hulagu Khan. Okay, who was the grandson of Chinggis Khan. However. Muhammad Khan, the favorite son of Balban, who was given the charge of governor of Multan to protect the frontiers from Mongol aggression, was killed in an encounter. Saddened by this tragedy, uh, tragedy Balban fell ill and died in 1286. The son of Balban, okay, his favorite son, was killed in an encounter because of the Mongol aggression. Because of that, Balban fell ill and died in 1286. The Khaljis, they were from 1290 to 1320. Jalaluddin Khalji from 1290 to 1296. As Balban's son Kaikubad was found unfit to rule, his three-year-old son Kaimars was placed on the throne. As there was no unanimity on the choice of regent and a council to administer the empire, the contending nobles plotted against each other, killing each other. You know, always it has been, you know, I told you in the starting itself, it was a common practice. Out of this chaos, a new leader, Malik Jalaluddin Khalji, the commander of the army, emerged supreme. While he ruled the kingdom for some time in the name of Kaikubad, soon sent one of his officers to get Kaikubad murdered, and Jalaluddin formally ascended the throne. However, Jalaluddin faced opposition on the grounds that he was an Afghan and not a Turk. But Khaljis were indeed Turks settled in Afghanistan before the establishment of Turkish rule and so they were Afghanized Turks. Okay? Jalaluddin won many battles and even in old age, old age he marched out against the Mongol hordes and successfully halted their entry into Okay, he was also uh, able to stop the Mongols to enter India. Alauddin, a nephew and son in law of Jalaluddin Khaji, was appointed governor of Kara, invaded Malwa, and his campaign yielded a huge booty. 
The success of this campaign stimulated his urge to embark on a campaign to raid Devagi, the capital city of Yadava kingdom in the Deccan. On his return, he arranged to get Jalaluddin Khalji murdered and captured the throne. Again, the person who was very dear and who was very trustworthy, they only plot against uh, these people and again they kill and they sit in the throne. Allahuddin Khalji. Allahuddin spent the first year of his rule in eliminating the enemies and strengthening his position in Delhi. Soon he turned his attention to establish a firm hold over the nobles. He dismissed several of his top officers. He was particularly severe with the nobles who had shifted loyalty and opportunistically joined him against Jalaluddin. Mongol threats. Mongol raids pose a serious challenge to Allahuddin. During the second year of his rule in 1298, when Mongols stormed Delhi, the army sent by Allahuddin succeeded in driving them back. But when they returned the following year with more men, people of suburbs of Delhi had to flee and take refuge in the city. Allahuddin had to meet the problem head on in ensuing the battle, Mongols were routed. Yet raids continued till 1305 when they ravaged the Doab region. This time, after defeating them, the Sultan's army took a large number of Mongols as prisoners and slaughtered them mercilessly. But the Mongol minutes continued. The last major Mongol incursion took place in 1307 to 1308. The term Mongol refers to all Mongolic speaking nomadic tribes of Central Asia. Okay? In the 12th century, they had established a large kingdom which included most uh, modern day Russia, China, Korea, Southeast Asia, Persia, India, the Middle East and the Eastern Europe under the leadership of Genghis Khan. Their phenomenal success is attributed to their fast horses and brilliant cavalry tactics and their openness to new technologies and King Khan's skill in manipulative politics. Military campaigns. The inability of Sultanate to effectively harness the agrarian resources of its North Indian territories to sustain its political ambitions was evident in its relentless military campaigns in search of loot and plunder. Allahuddin's campaign into Devagiri 1296, 1307 and 1314, Gujarat 1299, 1300, Ranthambore in 1301 and Chittor in 1303 and Malwa around 1305 were meant to proclaim his political and military power as well as to collect loot from the defeated kingdoms. It was with the same plan that he unleashed his forces into the Deccan. The first target in peninsula was Devagiri in western Deccan. Allahuddin sent a large army commanded by Malik Kafur in 1307 to capture Devagiri fort. Following Devagiri, Pratapa Rudradeva, the Kakatiya ruler of Varangal in Telangana region was defeated in 1309. In 1310, the Hoesala ruler Veera Ballala III surrendered all his treasures to the Delhi forces. Malik Kafur then set out for the Tamil country. Though Kafir's pro, uh, Kafur's progress was obstructed by heavy rains and floods, he continued his southward journey, plundering and ravaging the temple cities of Chidambaram and Srirangam as well as the Pandyan capital Madurai. Muslims in Tamil provinces fought on the sides of Pandyas. Okay, Muslims still supported the Pandyas against Malik Kafur. Malik Kafur advised them to desert so that he would not have any occasion to spill the blood of his fellow Muslims. Though there are exaggerations about the amount of booty he carried, there is no denying the fact that he returned to Delhi with an enormous booty in 1311. After Malik Kafur's invasion, 
the Pandya kingdom suffered an eclipse and the Muslim state subordinate to the Delhi Sultanate came to establish in Malay. Okay, the Pandya kingdom became very weak. In 1335, the Muslim governor of Madurai, Jalaluddin Asan Shah, threw off his allegiance to Delhi kingdom and declared his independence. Again, the same story. Allowed means internal reforms. The vast annexation of territories was followed by extensive administrative reforms aimed at stabilizing the government. Allahuddin's first measure was to deprive the nobles of wealth they had accumulated. It had provided them the leisure and means to hatch conspiracies against the Sultan. Marriage alliances between families of noblemen were permitted only with the consent of the Sultan. Okay, Sultan was to be consulted before even, even getting married. The Sultan ordered the villages held by proprietary rights as free gifts and religious endowments be bought back under the royal authority and the control. Okay. He curbed the powers of traditional village officers by depriving them of their traditional privileges. Corrupt royal officials were dealt with sternly. The Sultan prohibited liquor and banned the use of intoxicating drugs. Gambling was forbidden and gamblers were driven out of the city. However, despite uh, the widespread violations of prohibition rules eventually forced the Sultan to relax the restrictions okay so he was doing a lot of good things he was cutting down the uh, power you know of the uh, the officers who were you know very reluctant towards the people okay he was also uh, you know uh, uh, cleaning the corrupt people okay Allahuddin collected land taxes directly from the cultivators the village headman who traditionally enjoyed the right to collect them was now deprived. So the middleman is gone. Okay, the village headman. The tax pressure of Allahuddin was on rich and not on the poor. Okay, he was targeting the rich people. Allahuddin set up the postal system to keep in touch with all the parts of his sprawling empire. Okay, he had postal uh, system also developed. This was one of the Alauddin Khalji's coin. Sultan's market reforms. Alauddin was the first Sultan to pay his soldiers in cash rather than giving them a share of booty. As the soldiers were paid less, the prices had to be mentioned and controlled. Moreover, Alauddin had to maintain a huge standing army. In order to restrict prices of essential commodities, Alauddin set up an elaborate intelligence network to collect information on black marketing and hoarding. So he kept a uh, spy network. Okay, they used to collect information regarding the black marketing, hoarding, and you know uh, uh, these people who get involved into the practices. Okay, the transactions in the bazaars, the buying and selling, and the bargains made were all reported to the Sultan by his spy. Market superintendents, reporters, and spies had to send daily reports on prices of essential commodities. Violators of the price regulators were severely punished. If any deficiency in weight was found, an equal weight of flesh was cut from seller's body and thrown down before his eyes. Okay, so it's very good. Like you know, he used to take care of the poor people very nicely. Alauddin's successors. Alauddin nominated his eldest son Khizr Khan as his successor. However, Alauddin's confidant at the time was Malik Kafur. So, Malik Kafur himself assumed the authority of the government. But Kafur's rule lasted only 35 days as he was assassinated by hostile nobles. Okay, this is the Alauddin Khalji's tomb. Thereafter, there were a series of murders which culminated in the Ghazi Malik, a veteran of several campaigns against the Mongols ascending the throne of Delhi in 1320 as Giyasuddin Tukulak. He murdered the incumbent Khalji, ruler Khasrau, and thereby 
prevented anyone from Khalji dynasty claiming the throne. Thus began the rule of Tughlaq dynasty which lasted until 1414. Okay, the next will be the Tughlaq dynasty and we will see it in the coming chapter. I hope you find the video useful for your preparation and please do comment, uh, leave a comment such that we can know like if you are liking the video or if there are any changes or if you want to give some suggestions or feedback, please leave a comment and you can reach us on the number uh, provided here for the WhatsApp or you can even mail us and uh, please subscribe to the channel if you are new and uh, we provide all the lectures free of cost and uh, also give a lot of uh, regular information so i uh, you know suggest you to uh, be regular to the channel that's all for today guys thank you and have a great day